this election, your choice couldn't be more important. Our candidate is in flattering lighting and full bright color. Their candidate is in grainy high contrast black and white. Spotted through a telephoto lens from behind a bush, coming back from God only knows where. Our guy points at the horizon and holds a baby. Their guy doesn't have a baby. Their guy has a golf club. The voiceover for our guy is calm, measured, bright. Their guy gets the lower register. And sometimes we slow down. Our guy has clean headlines and the beautiful lens flare America needs. Here's a scary graph over a photo of their guy awkwardly laughing. Snap zoom. Do you want a snap zoom like that in office? Here's a photo of our guy saluting military veterans. Jump cuts, flashes, static, aggressive colors. You can't trust a guy with graphics like this. Our guy gets stock footage of sunrises and an American flag. Their guy's flag is upside down and on fire. Intercut with overdue bills, war, and a crying baby. This election, the choice is yours. Their guy or our guy. Inspiring slogan. Yeah, I thought about wearing a, yeah, anyway. I think we can all see that and be like, yeah, that makes sense a little bit, right? After my wife and I watch that, it seems like every uh, political ad campaign com commercial totally fits that bill, doesn't it? <laughs> anyway, good morning, my name is Paul. I'm the lead pastor here, in case we never met. I, and, I, and I've got news for you. Uh, in, a, in like less than 30 days from today, the political ad campaigns and mailers will stop. I thought I might get an amen on that one, right? That was a pretty robust applause right there. But all joking aside, I've been asked multiple times over the last couple of weeks, Polly, Paul, oh, what's, uh, what's our role? What should we do as Christians, as the church? How should we respond to the current political landscape that we find ourselves in? And so I want to take a few minutes to talk about that right now. And I just also want to say, if you're new with us, if this is your first weekend at Faith E Church, we normally don't do this, but I believe this is timely. It's timely because actually later this week, as a matter of fact, specifically on October 11th, Mail-in ballots and absentee ballots will be sent to your homes. So it's timely. It's also timely because we're studying the Gospel of Mark. And a few weeks ago, we talked about the very first thing that Jesus said when he started his public ministry on planet Earth. The first words he spoke in Mark 1.15 was this, The time has come. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. Amen. You see, as followers of Jesus... We are ultimately citizens of an eternal kingdom, a heavenly kingdom, and that, my friends, is good news, is it not? But it also means that we have a responsibility to be the best citizens today in the society in which God has placed us. The words of St. Augustine, he said this, Christians should be the most engaged and active citizens as participants in the social order. So what's that look like? What does that mean for us today in the current cultural climate and political climate that we're in? Well, I want to propose three things. We should do three things to be active and engaged citizens. First, we need to be people who pray. The Bible says in 1 Timothy that we are to pray for those who are in authority. We should pray for them so that we can lead peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. Should be people who pray, but I think sometimes it's easy to say, you know what, I just don't have time to pray. I've got more important things to do than to take time and abide with Jesus, take time and pray. The very first verse we're going to look at when we get to the passage we're studying today, Mark 1.35, we find Jesus, after a full day, the day before, of casting out demons and healing the sick, a full day of doing all that, what's he do the next morning? He gets up early while it's still dark, he goes to a place of solitude and he prays. I can't think of any more important work than anybody ever did than our Lord, yet he always had time to pray. Could you imagine if all us Christians prayed as much as we complained about the state of our culture? Could you imagine what that'd be like? I think there'd be a revival. I know this is convicting. It's convicting to me too. But let me tell you something. When I practice the ways of Jesus and I get up early before the sun comes up and I go to that spot in the house, 
And I get down on my knees and pray because Paul has got to get down on his knees when he prays. When I do that, when I have that rhythm in my life, it changes who I am and it changes the trajectory of my day. And I also want to tell you this, I have spent a lot of time on my knees praying about this Sunday and about what we're talking about. And it's settled in my soul along with the souls of the entire leadership team here at Faith E Church that what we're discussing now needs to be discussed. So be people of prayer. Find time to pray on your own. Practice the ways of Jesus. Abide with him in solitude and pray. We're also going to have some opportunities for corporate prayer later this month, October 27th. We're going to have a night of prayer and worship. We'll talk more about that. You should put that on your calendars. That's going to be a Sunday evening. In addition to that, we're going to be part of a larger initiative called Standing in the Gap. We're going to come together November 4th, the night before the election, as the body of Christ and spend an hour from 6 to 7 right here in the worship center and pray for our country. Be people of prayer. There's power in prayer. Let's pray. And also we need to be people as active and engaged citizens, people who vote. Now, I believe voting is a right, obviously, and it's a privilege, but I believe it's more than those two things. Yes, it's both of those, but I believe it's our very duty to vote. It's our duty to vote, plus it's the wise and the right thing to do. Now you may say, many people may say, what what difference does one vote make? What difference does my vote make? Well, I can assure you it makes a difference. Last election, the last election cycle, I read that there were about 90 million eligible evangelical Christians who could vote. Of that 90 million, 35 million voted. 55 million did not. If even 10% of that 55 million had voted, do you think that would have made a difference? Oh yeah, you bet it would. And plus, like I said, it's the wise and right thing to do. <clears throat> Excuse me, to do. Now look, full transparency. I'm not exactly jumping up and down with uber excitement at all of the candidates on the ticket. I'm not. <laughs> I'm still going to vote. We should vote. It's the wise and it's the right thing to do. And as Christians, we need to be informed voters That includes not just local, but also statewide, national, and it includes judges. We need to be informed voters about all of them. Judges have important roles, very important roles too. And then vote for those candidates who most closely align with biblical values and principles because the policies that they write, that they endorse and support, more often than not, will outlive the four to eight years that that person is in office. And some of those biblical principles that rise to the top are found in the first three chapters of God's holy word, are found in the first three chapters of Genesis. And so these should rise to the top of our list too. Things like God's design of biological sex, God's plan for marriage, and life. Life. The fact that all human beings are image bearers from the unborn to the person right before they give their last breath have dignity and value because they bear the image of the living God. And so allow those biblical principles to guide our voting. And I get it. (laughs) I get it. None of the candidates are perfect. None will be until King Jesus returns. None will be until King Jesus returns But I also know it a lot of times, I mean, really kind of feels in a lot of these elections like we're we're choosing the lesser of two evils. I understand. But in the words of John Stone Street, maybe instead of your vote, thinking of it as choosing the lesser of two evils, think about the potential your vote has to lessen evil. Lessen evil. John Quincy Adams, many, many years ago, walked out of the Capitol building after decades of him trying to abolish slavery. He was approached as he walked out of the Capitol building and he was asked, it's hopeless, it's not going to happen, the emancipation of the slaves, to which he replied, it's our duty and the results are God's. It's not just a privilege, not just a right, it's our duty to vote and trust God in it. We need to be informed, not just about the candidates, but also the initiatives that are going to be in the ballot. And I believe the most important initiative, hands down, is CI-128. And I know most of you are familiar with it, but CI-128 deals with abortion. Now, 
Now let me just pause right here and just say this. If you've been through an abortion, if you've had an abortion or you know somebody that has, I want you to hear what I'm saying right now. God's grace is enough for you. The reality is every single one of us, every single one of us have fallen short and need the mercy, compassion, love, grace, and forgiveness of Jesus Christ. And it's extended to every single person who will come to him. We're going to talk about this a little later in the service, but I want you to hear that now. But I also want to talk about CI 128 specifically because if passed, it would enshrine abortion into the Montana State Constitution, effectively ending the conversation. And it would allow for extreme abortions at any stage of pregnancy, including late term and partial birth. Planned Parenthood and their partners are planning to spend upwards to $30 million trying to get this passed in the state of Montana. And I can tell you most of that money is coming from out of state. And let me say this, CI 128, don't listen to many of the messages because it does not support women. Actually, it abandons them and their precious unborn, and it liberates men from our responsibility as leaders, as husbands, and as fathers. It silences the voice of the unborn and it violates dignity, life, and biblical teaching because the Bible says that God himself formed us in our mother's wombs and that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. So let's be the church on this one. Let's stand for the voice of the most vulnerable image bearers out there by standing for the voice of the unborn and voting no on CI 128. Pray, vote, and finally... We can't miss this. In the midst of everything else, we must love others. And we don't get to choose. Jesus calls us to love people because all people are made in the image of God. And a couple ways that we can love other people is by voting, that's loving your neighbor, and by praying for other image bearers. All image bearers, no matter how they vote, what they think, and how they act, we must love them. We don't participate in what they're doing, but we love them with the truth that sets them free. Amen. Our only hope, our only hope is in Jesus Christ because he alone can heal our land and heal our hearts. In the words of Chuck Colson, salvation does not rest in Air Force One, but in Jesus of Nazareth. And let me tell you this, Jesus be coming back, and when he does, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is king, he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. But until he returns, let's be active and engaged citizens. Pray, vote, love others, and let's take as many people as we possibly can into the kingdom of heaven because that's what the citizens of God do. As I close out this first portion of the teaching time, I'm going to ask Chuck, Chuck Wood, would you uh, come up and close us in prayer? Chuck's one of our elders here. I love Chuck. I look up to him, mentor, godly man, but I know Chuck would tell you he needs God's grace too. And uh, Chuck's going to close us in prayer, and I appreciate our elder board here. And let me just say this before he prays. On your way out today, we'll have a little literature for you, a handout that covers exactly what I just talked about. Underneath that, those three points of pray, vote, and love, you'll also see a link to Montana Family Foundation. We trust them. On there, you'll find more voter information, voter guide, things of that that could benefit you. And then at the bottom of that front page, you'll see a list of the names of our elders. If you have any questions about what I talked about, talk to me, another pastor, or any one of our elders. And then on the other side of that handout, you'll find more information about CI 128. Encourage you to grab that on your way out today. Chuck, would you close us in prayer? This you bow time. with me for a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we come before you, Lord. We know that you are the one who raises up leaders. You have in the past have put kings on the throne and taken them down. This is your world. This is your kingdom. We are your creation, Lord. But you do, as your people, we have a responsibility, Lord. So I do pray with the election coming up that we will pray for our leaders and pray for our nation. And, 
and pray for those who are hurt by all that's been happening lately, Lord, uh, for Israel. And uh, Father, in that means that we would be your people, when we pray that we would pray with love, not with hatred, but we would pray not for just our will, Lord, but your will be done. Because if your will is done on this earth, uh, then things will always be well. But Father, uh, as Paul said, we need to be on our knees praying, Lord. And so in the days and weeks ahead, would we pray for our nation, we pray for our leaders, and would we seriously understand the issues and that we would look forward and check out what each candidate stands for. And then, Lord, would your Holy Spirit move on our hearts to vote for things that support your will and your good. And then, Father, as far as voting, it is a privilege. Not all countries are free. There's been a very high price paid, Lord, that we can, in our country, we have the right and the freedom to vote. So may we take that seriously. May we go to the polls. May we look at the issues, study the issues, and vote for people who will support biblical values, Lord. And then as far as uh, the abortion issue, Lord, you are the author and giver of life. You are the creator of life. Life is precious to you, and it's precious to us. May we take it seriously this, this year, and as we go to the polls, would we vote no against CI 128 and Lord we do pray as a church that it will be defeated that life is so important and so may we protect the unborn we give you thanks and praise ask your blessing upon our nation our church and our people may we be your people and may we make a difference in the world it's in Jesus name that we pray all these things in his name amen thanks Chuck I shouldn't have said, uh, Chuck, would you close us in prayer because we ain't done yet. You ready to look at Mark 1, 35 to 45? Come on, we get to look at God's word today. That's a good thing. So if you would, take your Bibles, your scripture journals, open them up to Mark 1, 35 to 45. And look, I promise I won't be preaching for another 40 minutes, just 39 or so. Just kidding. Why don't you stand up and uh, let's get locked in on God's word and follow along if you would as I read again Mark 1, 35 to 45. We've got the verses on the screen as well. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Simon and his companions went to look for him, and, Ed, and everyone was looking for him. They exclaimed, everyone is looking for you. Jesus replied, let us go somewhere else to the nearby villages so I can preach there also. That is why I've come. So he traveled throughout Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and driving out demons. A man with leprosy came to him and begged him on his knees, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus was indignant. And he reached out his hand and touched the man, saying, I am willing, be clean. Immediately the leprosy left him and he was cleansed. Jesus sent him away at once with a strong warning. See that you don't tell this to anyone, but go show yourself to the priests and offer sacrifices that Moses commanded for your cleansing as a testimony to them. <sighs> Instead, he went out, began to talk freely, spreading the news. As a result, Jesus could no longer enter a town openly, but stayed outside in lonely places. Yet the people still came to him from everywhere. Jesus, once again, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you are willing to stay out in lonely places for our behalf. What a king we serve. Holy Spirit, we invite you to speak to us today. We come desperately needing to hear from you. Thank you for the treasure trove of the word of God, of your word. Speak to us today. May we be transformed to look more like the king that we serve. And I pray this in the mighty name of King Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. Like I mentioned already, uh, there in verse 35, we find that, well, the day after Jesus had finished doing all those things, he wakes up, he goes to a place of solitude while it's still dark, it's early in the morning, and he prays. What a pattern, like I talked about, what a rhythm for us to follow too. That's practicing the ways of Jesus. Well, evidently, Peter and the other disciples, they didn't get up so early. Because when they woke up, Jesus wasn't around. So they go out looking for him. It says everybody was looking for him, and when they found Jesus, that's what they told him. 
In verse 37, Peter and the other disciples say, Jesus, everybody is looking for you. And in Greek, the thrust of that statement, it gives us a picture as though everybody out hunting, everybody's trying to track Jesus down. That's literally what's being said here. They're all hunting Jesus down. As I read that, for me at least, it reminded me of the Truman Show. Anybody ever seen the Truman Show? A few of you. There at the end, you may know that Truman kind of disappears, and the entire town is locked arm in arm, walking around. If you've seen it, you know what I'm talking about, and they're looking for Truman. Truman, Truman, where are you at? And I read that. That's kind of what it reminded me of. Okay, well, maybe it wasn't exactly like that, but you get the idea. Everybody's looking for Jesus, and when they find him, again, Peter says, everybody is out looking for you. And really, that statement by Peter and the other disciples, it's kind of a thinly veiled rebuke of Jesus. They're kind of rebuking Jesus, because what they're saying is, hey, Jesus, come on, what's up? What are you doing? There's all kinds of people that need to be healed. You're famous, Jesus. Come on. Your popularity is rising. Let's go. To which Jesus replies in verse 38, Let's go somewhere else, to the nearby village, so I can preach there also. That's why I came. Jesus wasn't interested in winning a popularity contest. He wasn't interested in riding the rising swell of his popularity. He came to preach the good news that sets the souls of mankind free. Yes, in his mercy, his grace, his compassion and love for people, he cast out demons and he healed the sick. But if that's all he came to do, he would have only been dealing with the symptoms. But he came to deal with the source of the destructive power that causes suffering and death. He came to deal with and destroy sin. That's what he came to do. The miracles that Jesus performed, really, they pointed to the fact that he has a complete authority over the entire cosmos, that which is seen and that which is unseen. The miracles that he performed, they really pointed to the fact that he is king. He's the son of God. He's the Messiah. He's the savior of the world. You see, Jesus didn't come to build health and wellness centers. Uh Uh-uh. He came, and with him came the kingdom of God so that mankind can be reconciled back to God. That's good news. That's why Jesus came. They didn't understand it, the disciples at this point, at this side of the cross, but we understand it now on this side of the cross, and they would come to understand it, but we have to keep all of that on the top of our minds as we work through this passage. You with me? Give me a little head now. I want to make sure you're still tracking. All right. Well, then we see in verse 39 that Jesus leaves Capernaum. He begins to travel throughout the greater region of Galilee. At that time, there were over 200 towns throughout Galilee, and he's going town to town preaching the good news. And then he runs into a guy with leprosy. He runs into a leper. I'm really going to try hard to say leper instead of leopard. So if I mess up, just roll with me, okay? But let me talk a little bit about leprosy. When you see the word leprosy in the scriptures, it actually covers over 72 different infectious skin diseases, leprosy. The worst of all of them is something that we now call today Hansen's disease, the worst kind of form of leprosy you could have. Hansen's disease, disease, that kind of leprosy, it meant that your skin would be disfigured and become scale-like. It actually attacked the person's central nervous system making it so that they wouldn't even feel pain. They could do things like walk on coals, walk on glass. It's reported that many of those people with that kind of leprosy, after they woke up, uh, after a night's sleep, they would wake up and find that their fingers were gone because they'd been chewed off by rats and they didn't even know it. They couldn't even feel it. This is bad. It's really their flesh was rotting off of their bones. It was rotting away. In this form of leprosy during the days of antiquity, during the ancient days when Jesus walked planet Earth, it was uncurable. Nothing you could do. It was basically a death sentence. They referred to people with Hansen's disease as the walking dead. Long before the TV show come out, I'm just saying. There was a statement that would fly around back then that it was easier to raise somebody from the dead than cure them of this form of leprosy. The man in verse 40, this is what he had. This is what he had. You can imagine how scary it would be to hear that kind of news. It's not something you wanted to have. You wouldn't want to be around that at all. So the way they dealt with it back then is they would make lepers stay outside of the city. You may know that. They had to live outside of the city by themselves, apart from the rest of the people. And at some level, I think if I was living in the city, I'd be good with that. Kind of makes sense, doesn't it? 
In addition to that, lepers had to identify themselves. And the way they did that, we find this in Leviticus chapter 13. They had to wear torn clothes. Their hair was unkept. This is in Leviticus 13. Check it out on your own. Torn clothes, hair unkept. And then they had to wear something to cover the lower portion of their face. It's basically how we all looked during COVID-19. You know what I mean? (laughs) Torn clothes, hair a mess, and cover... Anyway. Speaking of covid I'm going, to, I'm going to pull this out and, and yell this out if you know what perhaps I may have used. This, is, this was sitting in my office, still propped up. What do you think I perhaps used this stick for during COVID? Six-foot social distancing stick. That's right. Now, I didn't run around jabbing people saying, stay six feet away from me. I promise I didn't. Use this for ch- setting up chairs and things like that. But social distancing for them according to Jewish law, for those lepers meant that, they, meant that they could not get within 50 paces of another person. It often meant for them at that time, in, in a lot of cases, they couldn't come within 50 paces. That's 125 feet. So if I stand in the back of this worship center, kind of by the screen here, I've got a black X on the floor and some lucky person way in the back, I'm going to ask you to stand. Eric Allen, would you stand up? You see that? I know you saw that black X. I measured this out. This is 125 feet between Eric and I. Now, imagine I'm a leper. And Eric, I want you to just take two or three steps my direction. Unclean! Unclean! Is what I would have to yell out. Thanks, Eric. You can sit down. I appreciate that. I hope that doesn't scar you forever. This is what you get for sitting in the back, just saying. (laughs) Do you remember how isolated and disconnected and alone six feet of social distancing made us feel? Could you imagine that kind of social distancing, 125 feet, and if somebody got too close, I'd have to yell out, unclean, unclean, unclean? Having the disease was one thing, but the ravages it took upon somebody's psyche, their emotional state took it to a whole other level. And then in verse 41, we find that this leper, well, (laughs) he, he breaks the law. He comes within 125 feet of Jesus. He comes within six feet of Jesus, and he prays to God because this leper, he falls on his knees, and he says to Jesus, if you are willing, would you make me clean? You can make me clean. This is what he cries out to Jesus. That's his prayer. And at first glance, it may seem like this guy lacks a little faith. Like, really? But not so fast. Because what he's saying to Jesus is this, if it be your will. How did Jesus teach his disciples to pray? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. It's recognizing the sovereignty of God. This man recognizes the sovereignty of Jesus and says, if it's your will, would you heal me? I know you can. Would you make me clean? Would you make me whole? And then we see (laughs) the first thing that happens with Jesus is he becomes emotional in verse 41. Because there, in the beginning of verse 41, we see that Jesus was indignant. He was angry. Now, it's interesting. Some translations actually say that Jesus was compassionate or that he showed pity for the man. Now, that seems to, those two things seem to oppose each other. So, which one is it? Was Jesus indignant and angry or or did he have compassion in his pity? Which one? Well, I believe it was both. Hence, the title to this portion of the sermon, the teaching time, is Indignant Compassion. Here's what I mean. I believe Jesus was indignant at the ravages ravages and brokenness that sin has caused upon his created world. But I also believe that he looked at his created people and the suffering that this man was going through, and he had compassion. Indignant compassion. And I want you to notice Jesus' response in verse 41. He didn't say a word before, well, he did, but before he said a word, what does he do? He reaches out and touches the man. You can bet 
that sent a message. A message, I believe, louder than any spoken word would have sent. Because once again, during that time, for a clean person to touch an unclean person meant that that, uh, that that clean person then became unclean. But Jesus didn't become unclean. It worked in the opposite way for Jesus because it's his cleanness that cleansed the leper. And then Jesus says to him, I'm willing, I'm willing, be clean. And immediately, there's that word immediately here in the Gospel of Mark, immediately, the man was made clean, he was cleansed. Now I want you to think about something for just a moment. We know that this man's leprosy was in advanced stages. It had been going on for many years. If we look at the account in Luke chapter 5, Dr. Luke says that this man was full of leprosy. So for many years, this man had that kind of social distancing, had never experienced a physical touch, things that we take for granted, hadn't received a hug from somebody that cared for him, he hadn't held hands with his sweetheart, this man never, for many years, didn't have a child, a grandchild climb up on his lap. He didn't even have a high five or a handshake. No. The rabbis during that time, what they would do is extend a hand to pick up a stone to throw at the leopards. But the Son of God extended his hand and touched an untouchable man. That's called the compassion of Jesus Christ. And he calls us. Really, he calls us to go and do the same. We're not called to be a bunch of religious elites more interested in picking up a stone and throwing it at people. He calls us as Christians. He calls us as his church to be willing to reach out our hand and touch the untouchable with the compassion of Christ. That's what we're called to do. Who are the untouchable? Well, for most of us, it's probably not going to be somebody suffering from an infectious skin disease called leprosy. I mean, it could be. Those untouchables that we're called to love are certainly going to be those in society who are marginalized, who are unseen. Those untouchables are going to be, for sure, in our life, those people who are just sometimes hard to love. I'm not going to give you any il illustrations or examples there because you can figure that out on your own. Those untouchables are going to be those people that, you know, when we love them, things get messy. Those untouchables are going to be those people in our life who vote differently, who think differently, and who act differently than us. Exactly what I talked about earlier. Sometimes that means having indignant compassion hating the sin but loving the person who's trapped in it, indignant compassion, recognizing that image bearer, they're not so much the enemy but they're victims of the enemy. And loving them may mean just something simple. It's, it doesn't always include, oh, well, it doesn't mean that we become BFFs with them. I mean, that may happen. That's not what we're talking about here. And for those of you who don't know what a BFF is, it's best friend forever. There you go. But it might just be something simple, a word, a touch, a handshake, maybe letting them know that there's a God who loves them as much as he's loved anybody at any other time. Because that's what citizens of the kingdom of heaven, citizens of God do. It's on full display with Jesus here in the beginning of Mark. And after the leper was cleansed, Jesus sent him away with a strong warning, saying to the man, don't tell this to anyone. Those words, strong warning, a lot of times they were used in the Greek language to describe a horse when it snorts. Jesus is snorting at this guy, in a sense, and he's saying, hey, don't tell anybody, yo bro, keep your mouth shut. Now why would Jesus tell this guy, hey, keep your mouth shut? Why would he say that to him? Well, a couple reasons. First... Remember what Jesus came to do. He didn't want any hindrance to his preaching of the gospel by those who may oppose him and by the news spreading that may happen. Also, and I believe more importantly, is this. Jesus understood the misdirected motives of the crowd. He understood the hearts of the people. They were coming to him, not in faith, but they wanted relief. They wanted to follow the guy that they thought would give them everything that they ever wanted. He understood the hearts of men. I believe that's part of the reason why he had some indignant anger as part of this. They were coming to him because they wanted the miracle and not the miracle worker. They didn't want to hear a message of repentance. 
They wanted to be part of the kingdom without the king. They wanted free health care without surrendering their life to Jesus and obeying his spoken word. Glad we never have a problem with that. Well, after Jesus tells this guy, keep your mouth shut, he gives him other instructions in verse 44. He says, go show yourself to the priests and offer the sacrifices that Moses commanded for your cleansing as a testimony to them. Now, this all seems kind of bizarre, like out, a little out of place. First, Jesus says, keep your mouth shut. Now he's saying, hey, go to the priest, offer sacrifice, do this cleansing thing, this law of Moses. And again, we've got to ask, what's going on here? Why is Jesus telling him this? Well, first, we need to remember Jesus came not to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. And he is Lord of the law. And at that time, they would have had to fulfill a legal obligation to be allowed back into society. They would have gone, had to have gone to the priest and had proof from the priest that they were cleansed. That's what's taking place here. So it's kind of for this guy's benefit that Jesus sent him to the priest. But even more importantly, once again, at the end of verse 44, we see that Jesus says, do this as a testimony to them, to those priests, as a witness to them. Now, what's that mean? We need to understand this ceremonial act of being cleansed with the priest, this law of Moses. In order to understand that, we have to go back to Leviticus chapter 14. That's where this is at. We don't have time to go through all those verses. Hopefully you did on your own this past week. It was part of the reading plan at the bottom of your scripture journals. If you didn't, I encourage you to go through it later today. But in verses 4 through 7, what we would see in those verses, I'm just going to list these out on the screen. They're listed in your worship guide. But this essentially is the ceremony that you would read about in those verses. First, you would find two clean, live birds. Sorry, Lonnie, these are live birds. You'd find two clean, live birds. But they would kill one of them. And then... Take that dead bird, mix its blood with water. This is what's happening, again, in Leviticus with the priest there for somebody who wants to be cleansed. Then they would take that dead bird, the mixture, um, and then they would find the live bird. Take the live bird along with some cedar wood, scarlet yarn, hyssop, bundle all those together. The priest would then dip that live bird in the blood and water mixture, and then they would take that and sprinkle it on the person seven times, declaring them cleansed. After that, they would take the live bird out in the field, release it, and that live bird, while still bearing the marks of the ceremony, would then ascend into the heavenlies. It would fly away and disappear. Weird, right? <laughs> I think this is part of the reason why so many people's Bible reading plans end in Leviticus. <laughs> but I want you to catch this. I don't want you to miss this. You see that list? You also see the New Testament references there in your worship guide. I want to go through those right now. Because after Jesus died on the cross, the, the soldier pierced his side. And what came out? Blood and water. Blood and water. And he was crucified on a piece of wood called the cross. Before he was crucified, they stripped him. And what they put on him? A robe of scarlet. And Jesus on the cross said, I'm thirsty, I'm thirsty. So they raised up a sponge to him on what? A hyssop branch. And Jesus didn't stay in the grave, he rose. And in his resurrected body appeared before the disciples. And in his resurrected body, he still bore the marks of his crucifixion. So he said, check out my hands and my feet. Luke 24. And then finally, at the end of Luke, we find that Jesus disappears into the heavenlies. And today he's at the right hand of the Father. You picking up what's being thrown down here? This is good stuff, is it not? Leviticus 14, that thing that kind of seemed a little weird, and Mark 1, it points to the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. You can't make this up. This is God's word. Let me tell you, if you ain't studying it, you're missing out. This is why Jesus sent the now healed leper to the priest as a testimony, as a witness to them. Now it makes sense. But our leper buddy, he just couldn't help himself, could he? He couldn't keep his mouth shut. No, he talked freely, and the news naturally spread. Spread probably like wildfire. And, and can you blame the guy? I mean, come on, I'd probably do the same thing. You go from being among the walking dead to now walking among the living. Something ironic about this. Last week we talked about how Jesus told the demons to keep their mouth shut. What they do? They listened. He tells this dude to keep his mouth shut. He don't listen. Us people have problems with listening to Jesus sometimes, don't we? 
Because today, Jesus tells us not to keep our mouths shut, but to proclaim the good news to all ends of the world, including loving our neighbors right next door. But it seems like we more and more just want to remain quiet. Maybe we need to take a page out of this leper's book. Because in a way, he's really just a disobedient evangelist, isn't he? Maybe we need to take a page out of his book and realize that sometimes sharing the gospel just means sharing our story and all that Jesus has done for us. When he did that, he said, hey, my leprosy, I'm cleansed. The leprosy stopped, but then the good news spread. Which, as a result, we see at the end, verse 45, Jesus could no longer enter a town openly, but he stayed outside in lonely places. Yet the people still came to him from everywhere. One last thing I want you to grab a hold of here. Those two words, lonely places. Underline them, circle them. Lonely places. You see, this leper, remember, lived outside the city, socially distanced from everybody else. He lived in a lonely place, but he was cleansed by the touch and word of Jesus Christ. But now Jesus, the clean one, could no longer enter a city, at least openly, but instead he had to stay outside in lonely places. Jesus traded places with the leper. And that's what he offers every single one of us because the reality is this, we're all outcasts. We all stand as untouchable lepers before a holy God because we're infected with a disease called sin. This is what Jesus came to deal with and he did it by, be by becoming an outcast himself so that us outcasts can now enter the kingdom of God. The king became an outcast so outcasts can now enter his kingdom. And he did it with indignant he did it with indignant, indignant compassion because he allowed himself to be led outside of the city to a lonely place called Calvary. And it was there on Calvary where for the joy that was set before him and he endured the cross and he despised its shame, he took the legal punishment that was deserved to us and due to us, he took it upon himself because he who knew no sin became sin. The clean one took all the uncleanness of all of mankind upon himself so that now we can stand clean in front of a holy God as sons and daughters of a living God. That's what Jesus did. And he ascended to the right hand of the Father, but before he did, he promises to always be with us. So for all of us who follow Jesus, we have the very spirit of Christ inside of us. And that makes us citizens of a heavenly kingdom, a place where the role and love of Jesus will never end. That's the good news. That's what Jesus came to do. That's the gospel. The king became an outcast, so outcasts can now enter into his kingdom. Let's pray. I don't know if you're here today and you don't know Jesus. Perhaps you've been living far from him. You might be here thinking, I am nothing but an outcast. Well, I want to assure you, his grace is enough. No matter how unclean you may feel and what you've done, come to Jesus. Because what he'll tell you is, I am willing, be clean. Perhaps the Spirit of God is prompting you today to take that first step of having a relationship with his son, Jesus. And if that's you, it begins with a conversation. <laughs> the leper fell on his knees and he talked to God, talked to Jesus now and just say, Jesus, I'm sorry. I know I'm unclean, but you can make me clean. Just tell him I'm sorry. And let him know you're ready to follow him, turn from the way you were going and follow him. Pray that to Jesus right now. Jesus, I'm sorry. And then thank him that he became the substitute. He fulfilled the legal obligation on our behalf. Just say thank you, Jesus, for that. Punishment we deserved, he took upon himself. Say thank you. And then finally, let him know that you're ready to surrender your life to him. I mean, you might even be here today, and I don't know, you've been in church for a long time, and you got lots of things memorized, but you really don't know God because you've never talked to Jesus and you've never surrendered your life to him. He's king. He reigns. And he reigns with mercy and love. Let him know you're ready to surrender your life to him today.
And if that's you, if God's calling you into his family, into his kingdom, and you prayed that right now, would you just slip up your hand, leave it up, make eye contact with me, it won't embarrass you, it won't say anything, I just want to celebrate and thank God for you. This is huge. Don't miss this moment. I see you. Praise the Lord. Anybody else? This is the most important decision you'll ever make. Anybody else? Give you a moment. I believe the Holy Spirit's working, nudging. Perhaps he'll continue to work on your heart even after this. But don't miss this moment. Tomorrow's not guaranteed. Yeah. If you're joining online, you can connect with a pastor online as well. God, thank you for being the kind of God who invites people from everywhere and being willing to meet us in the lonely places that sometimes we're coming from. You are with us. Your presence is here, and we are grateful for that. Jesus, thank you for your sacrifice. Thank you for teaching us what it looks like to touch the untouchable. Help us to be your church and do just that. I pray this in your name. Amen. Can I ask you to please stand? Just a couple things before you take off. First, if you came prepared to give of tithes and offerings, we have boxes in the back that kind of blend in with the wall. You can drop it off there. You can do, do it online. There's a link there as well. I also want to say several hands go up today. Thank you, Lord, for that. But I, I would encourage for those of you who felt the prompt of the Holy Spirit, take a moment and fill out a Connect card. Just put on there your name, your phone number, and that today Jesus got a hold of you, and we'd love to get a hold of you and help you with your journey. Takes a little courage maybe doing that, dropping that off, hand it to a pastor, but it took a lot of courage for Jesus to go to the cross. I also would just say if you could use prayer for anything, I'll be up front along with some other pastors, godly men and women. It's always a privilege for us to pray with you and for you. And finally, don't forget to pick up that little piece of paper on your way out. Let's be active and engaged citizens. Let's be people of prayer. Inform voters who love others. Now it's time, the best part of the service, it's time to go out there and be the church. Let's be willing to touch the untouchable with the compassion and love of Jesus Christ. Have a great week. Love you guys.